Let us take hands and walk together over a crumbling bridge before light. The bridge was once painted a sunny yellow, but now it is gray and green from moss. The water down there is stagnant, it's true, but think of the stories that lie beneath, waiting to be told to those still living before the living in time come down to rest. Do we all go to sleep in shallow black water? Or, for some of us, is it clear? Someday, friend, you'll know. Until then, discover the delight of drawing with Dolores. Greetings, listeners. Today, I'm going to show you how to draw a cityscape. Just like New York City or London. It's a big city. I love the city. I love I love the small town I live in more though. Anyway, you just need to get a piece of paper and a pencil. And uh, let's put on your doodling face. Okay. So you take your your paper and uh let's turn it uh Turn it landscape, okay? And what you're gonna do is you're gonna, on the left side of your page, you're gonna draw two tall vertical lines. One, two. We have plenty of room on the right side of the page. We've got three more structures we're gonna draw. So between your two vertical lines, I want you halfway down, I want you to draw a line connecting them, okay? There we go. And what you just drew between the two poles is a bridge. Our city has a, a tall bridge. Okay? Now, on the far right side of your page, uh, just so we can keep everything even here, on the far right side, I want you to draw a large backward C. Okay, there we go. That's going to be a sports stadium. And what we just drew is the stands where all the people go to sports where they sit and I want you to connect the open part of your backward C with a vertical line here we go that's where the sports scores are shown and the ads that they have at the stadiums you know what let's let's extend that line further down the page if you have any room. Uh, that's that's going to be a road for uh, all the sports fans to get out in case there's a fire. Okay, now uh, in the middle, uh, in the ha left half of the middle, next to the bridge, I want you to draw about the height of your bridge and the poles, a tall rectangle. In the middle of that, we're going to draw a horizontal line about the same space as the walkway on your bridge. And that is a skyscraper and uh, with multiple floors now. It's very nice. And then our last bit here uh, is a, a horizontal line extending the bottom line of the rectangle, really, uh, all the way across, and that is a parking lot, so all the people who have jobs can uh, park their cars when they go to work, and uh, that's, um, that doesn't look right, oh no, you know what I think is going on, you know what I think is going on, I think you people
people and the crew are giving me bad pencils. Is it you? Is it you? And, um, that's all I have time for today. Maybe next time we'll draw something peaceful, like a field, a flat field. Story time, everyone. Story time. Today's story is The Devil and Betty Lee. I met the devil on the way to the carnival, only I didn't know it was the devil at the time. He looked like a one-armed beggar to me. Little miss, he said to me, can you spare some change? No, sir, I said. I don't have any. And this was a lie, for I had fifty cents in nickels rattling in my pocket like ten little bells. What about them coins in your pocket, miss, said the devil, squinting one eye like a man does when he's measuring something. Oh, I can't give those away. I'm taking them to the church, I said. And this was also a lie, unless there's such a thing as the church of cotton candy. Well, the devil, he got up real close, and he sniffed the air like a old bird dog. And when he quit sniffing the air, he said, But your family don't go to church. I was too caught up in my own story to realize the meaning of what he said, so I lied again. I said, no sir, but I'm giving my heart to Jesus today, and as his payment for forgiving me my sins, I'm giving up my fifty cents. Well, the devil threw off his dirty old coat and hopped up and down with laughter. Betty Lee, you're my kind of gal, he said, and he sang a funny little tune. He also had two arms all of a sudden. You're not going to no church, he told me correctly. You're going to the carnival, and when you get there, you're going to buy an armful of cotton candy. And after that, you're gonna track down Tandy Jessup because Charlie McKenna told everybody you was sweet on Tandy and you don't want him to know, even though it's true. The devil didn't stop there. He went on. In fact, he said, you're so sweet on Tandy Jessup, you've been dreaming up ways to get rid of Susie Allen, your rival for his affections. I didn't really know what to make of this talk. It was true. I meant to beat up the Jessup boy and I had hopes that a few snakes in Susie Allen's desk and some beetles in her hair, and a frog in her lunch pail, and some snails down her dress, might come across to her as an omen that their love was not meant to be. The devil suggested a rat instead of a frog, but he also told me there was a better way, even than that. By this point, I figured the man was not a one-armed beggar at all, but a two-armed Lucifer. Not being a church-going person, I assumed the devil only tormented the good Christians because it was so much fun to do. And seeing as Susie Allen was a good Christian, I asked the devil what he had in mind. And this is what he told me. Go on to the carnival, don't spend your nickels, don't beat up the Jessup boy, and leave Susie Allen to me. Then come back to this place tomorrow night, just before midnight. Bring your fifty cents, I'll tell you what to do with that. Then he went off skipping down the road. Well, I went to the carnival. I didn't beat up Tandy. I didn't collect any vermin for Susie Allen, and I kept my nickels. All right, I spent one on cotton candy, but I replaced it with one I found on the carousel floor. The next night, I came back to the place where I met the devil. He hopped up and down, spun around in circles, threw himself on his back, kicking his legs in the air. I wasn't alarmed by this, as I had seen my cat do much of the same things. When he was done with his convulsions and fitting, he said, There, by the end of the day tomorrow, Tandy Jessup will be in love with you, and he will marry you in two years' time. I offered him my nickels, but he told me to hold on to them. Keep them, he said. Keep them for ten years, and I'll come back for them then. And just as he had done the night before, he went off skipping down the road. The next morning I woke up, shocked to discover that I had changed. I was suddenly the most beautiful girl in town, second only to Susie Allen, who would soon be sent away due to a series of ailments most likely passed on by the rats who had mysteriously taken up residence in her family's house. True to the devil's words, Tandy fell in love with me, and we were married two years later when I was just sixteen. Our marriage was about like any other, I guess. We had two boys and a farm and enough money to keep things running. I eventually forgot all about the devil. 
I kept my nickels in a keepsake box in the wardrobe and forgot about them too. Eight years after Tandy and I were married, I went out to feed the pigs and saw a one-armed man with a begging bowl just outside our fence. He asked me if I could spare any change. No, sir, I said. I don't have any. My husband keeps all our money, and he isn't home. What about them coins you keep in a box in your wardrobe, the man asked with a yellow-toothed grin. And that's when it occurred to me who he was. I went inside to get the nickels, but when I handed them to the devil, he looked confounded. Where's the tenth, he said. I told him they were all there, but he insisted they were not. Where did this one come from, he said as he held up one of the coins. I told him I didn't see why it was any different from the others. It is different, he said, and he leaned in close. You see, I promised the love of Tandy Jessup to the owner of the tenth coin you would give me today. The last coin I count is this one here, and it doesn't belong to you. I knew what the devil was going to say next. I knew it like I knew my own face, and I already felt my hands curling up into fists as he told me it belongs to Susie Allen. Why, I reckon she's on her way to meet your husband now. You devil, I shouted. He just shrugged and slipped the nickels into his pocket. Devil I may be, he said, but I do keep up my end of a bargain. He then told me that on the very same day he and I met, he had promised Susie Allen that she would win Tandy's heart in ten years' time if she placed a nickel on the floor of the carousel. I was so shocked I couldn't speak. The devil scratched himself in a rude place and coughed. Your husband was supposed to trade in one of his shotguns today, I believe, he said. And wouldn't you know it, he forgot to take it with him. If you hurry on into town, you can catch him. And Susie, too. With that, the devil turned around and walked off down the road with a little bit of a skip in his step. Let's listen in on our inside voices. I'm Melba Sutter of Widowsbury, Massachusetts, being of sound mind and barely held together body, do hereby declare that this is my last will and my final testament. To my beloved eldest daughter, Mary Ann, and my son-in-law, Shane, I know that I did not want the two of you to marry, but you did and I'm glad for you both. I know that the last several years have been difficult for the both of you, and I'm sorry that I have no more money to give you. But what I'm leaving to you now makes a far greater statement of my affection for you. To you, I leave the flea collar worn by my long-departed Muffy. To my cherub of a grandson, Robert, I'm afraid that you've eaten all my sweets and I haven't the strength to procure any more for you. But Muffy always did love her biscuits. I leave what's left of them to you. To my daughter, Carol Louise, with your love of fine things, I do wish I had more to leave you. But nothing I could ever give you would outshine your own glamour. To you I leave your late father's brass ashtray. I loved your father very much, and you were his favorite. And he was quite fond of this ashtray. I think of you whenever I look at it. To my precious son, Jonathan, what an avid golfer you turned out to be. I only wish you could have turned pro with all the time and money you've put into your hobbies. Sadly, I have none of either to give you, but I do leave you these tea cloths. If you ever break a sweat, they're here for you. My children, I regret that these are all the possessions I can leave you. All my money is gone. I have already donated it to a rat sanctuary so that you cannot fight over it. My house, too, has already been given to the organization so that, upon my death, it may become a home for rescued rooms. Because, my darlings, during my life, the rats within my own walls were far more grateful for my garbage than anything I ever wasted on the spoiled lot of you. Postscript, I wish to be cremated. And now, ask. 
Rooney writes, When is a good time to tell a relatively new romantic partner about strange, unspeakable fetishes? Dearest Rooney, I'm here for you, and I'm glad that you asked, as I'm sure is your relatively new romantic partner. Indeed, your new romantic partner may be asking this very same question at this very same moment. Could this question be your paramour's fetish? I certainly can't tell. It's hardly unspeakable, but that may very well be the tippy top of the iceberg, as they say. But back to your question, Rooney. Let's say, for the sake of this answer, that your unspeakable fetish is dressing as a black widow spider, piercing your lover's side, liquefying his or her organs, and then consuming them. You vixen you. Your apprehension is understandable. The risk of rejection is quite high, but perhaps not so high as you might think. Something, after all, drew you to your darling to begin with. Perhaps there was something in their eyes, a feeble look that aligned with your very soul, a cry that only your heart could hear, begging, take me, take my body and devour it from the inside out, literally. Therefore, my first piece of advice for you is to cast aside your fears. There may be nothing to fear in the first place. When next you find yourself locked in a lover's embrace, ask for what you desire. Perhaps not all at once. Say to them, I would like it very much if we dressed as spiders. Then, another time, tell them, it would please me enormously if you allowed me to pretend that I'm liquefying your organs. Is all still well? No rejection yet? Then I'd say you're well on your way. Next time, say, what if it wasn't pretend this time? And the rest? as the saying goes, will be history. Now suppose your sweetheart doesn't want any of this. Whatever will you do? Worry not. Tis but a moment's embarrassment. Are there other activities you enjoy with your beloved? Is his or her company worth more than the sensation of liquefying their intestines, their stomach, their liver, etc.? Then enjoy what you have, and perhaps the two of you can meet in the middle on your licentious taboos. If not, Perhaps it would be better to move on. There's willing prey out there, I assure you. Not that I know from experience. I hope this brings you comfort. If any other listeners long for answers to queries long held, they may ask their questions by breathing into the ear of a molting dragonfly or by sending a letter to ask at goodnightdearmargaret.com. Tell me a story about someone you failed. Was it someone you loved? Was it someone you could have loved? Was it someone who wore their hopes like rouge upon their lips, lips that smiled for you until you faltered? Was it a friend or a summer trifle? Was it a disappointed partner? Were they counting on you to make right what so many before had made wrong? What pattern was the dress she wore when she walked away? Tell me that story. Tell me that story. Now. And now it's time to go back. Before we reach the end of the bridge, I'm sorry that I have to leave you, friend, but thank you for coming along. Good night, good night, dear Margaret. May angels bring you dreams. And when comes the sun, dear Margaret, we hope they'll allow you to wake. 15, 14, 20, 20, 18, 21, 19, 20, 20, 8, 5, 9, 18, 19, 13, 9, Good Night, Dear Margaret is written, produced, and narrated by me, Katie Towell. New episodes are posted monthly with a bonus episode for Patreon patrons. Special thanks go out to Chaz Simmons and Colin Hamilton for your support. To learn more, including how to subscribe and support the podcast, visit goodnightdearmargaret.com. 